Good afternoon. I'm Chris Fant, and uh, welcome to ASMA Grand Rounds. And uh, because today is the last program of the academic year, I get to take just one moment to introduce next year's program and the exciting presentations that we have scheduled, including uh, Peggy Lai talking about endotoxin in asthma, Jocelyn Cho at Mass General talking about the role, role of uh, allergic inflammation in asthma. Uh, Kaylin Tantasira is going to talk about microRNA in asthma. We've invited Juan Celadon to come back to talk, give us an update on asthma in Hispanics, and Megan Harden to talk about asthma in pregnancy. So it's an exciting program ahead, and we'll send you reminders as the uh, time comes closer. But today, uh, what I think is the holy, for me, the holy grail in thinking about asthma and asthma research, and, and that is the primary prevention of the development of asthma. And we have a terrific panel from Partners Asthma Center to discuss the topic, and I'd like to introduce the, introduce the speakers in the order that they will be presenting. We'd like to have three uh, brief uh, presentations followed by a group discussion. And Wanda Fipitanikol, has come from the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Children's Hospital to speak. Um, I think Gus, you're next. Gus Latanwa, Gus Latanwa from uh, Division of Network Medicine and the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division, and Joanne Sodillo from uh, Channing Division of Network Medicine. So three topics, three uh, approaches to the primary prevention of asthma, and uh, I should mention a special thank you to Wanda and Joanne for sort of pinch hitting for previously scheduled speakers and being willing to address these topics on relatively short notice. So without further ado, Dr. Fipitanikol, beginning the discussion of primary prevention of asthma. Thanks very much. So I, only, I was given 15 minutes, um, and when we had to present this trial to get approval to, uh, to get it um, submit, we had a two-hour site visit. So I did have to like truncate my slides, but I hope that this will help convince you that allergy is important in the development of asthma. Maybe by blocking atopy, we can actually prevent the disease. So my disclosures are there, and our, our charge in the next 15 minutes is to discuss this topic. So I'd like to start by reminding you the progression of allergy in little kids. It starts in early childhood, usually around one to two to three years of age. And Dr. Sheen and I did a study a couple years ago where we looked at 1,300 children from our allergy clinic. And as you can see, the progression of the development of allergy really escalates after the preschool age. We were actually also surprised that even outdoor allergens, which a lot of people think you don't get exposed or sensitized until you're much older, actually even starts in early preschool age. So you see the green, even 15% of our clinic had allergy even at the age of two. I'd like to remind you the whole allergic atopic march. So it starts with early eczema and food allergy. We see the allergists in our group see those in clinic every day. You've got that allergic, wheezy kid, and the family's asking me, what are my chances of developing an asthma? And in the back of our mind, we kind of know, you kind of can smell those kids that are going to go on to develop asthma. And then the rhinitis and allergen sensitization really takes off in the later school years out to age uh, 15 or so. But as you can see, it really, that early allergic child starts in infancy with the food allergy eczema and then goes on to rhinitis and then actually established asthma later on in life. So which came first? I mean, all of us know that wheezy kids also have viruses and they also have allergy. And so that question has been a burning question for a while, like which really is that pivotal risk factor for the development of asthma. So there's a nice study done by the Coast Group in Wisconsin where they took their 300 really high-risk children and actually put them into bins. Those who had allergy or atopy prior to reporting viral wheeze and those who had viral wheeze prior to developing atopy. 
And that they, the group had previously reported that rhinovirus, which is the common virus for the common cold, is the high risk factor for developing viral wheezing. And what they found from this study, as they followed them through time until they were age six, that interestingly, it's really those at-risk children, which was most of this cohort, that develop ATP or allergy first prior to wheezing, as opposed the, to the ones who have that viral wheeze first to developing asthma. As you can see, the risk is much higher in those with allergy first, suggesting that it's really ATP prior to viral wheeze, which is pivotal in the development of persistent asthma. This is a study done by the Manchester Asthma Allergy Group. Adam Kostovic shared me a lot of his data and I had great conversations with him in his group of five or 600 children that are high risk for developing asthma. And what he did was he looked at serum IgE levels to dust mite and cat in early preschool age at age three. And then he followed them over time and then he classified those with persistent asthma at the age of five or six. And as you can see, there's markedly increased risk of developing asthma if you had IgE to cat, dog, and dust mite in early childhood and your risk of asthma. His cohort, he also showed, they did some complicated analysis showing that while the allergy itself was important, but that if you throughout life in early childhood developed multiple allergy sensitizations, your risk also markedly, markedly improved really pointing to the fact that while viruses are important, it's really that ATP and IgE-mediated allergy and actually the timing of the sensitization that really markedly increases your risk for asthma. Another line of ed evidence came from the Illy von Moodyus group who also looked at about 1,000 children high risk and have been following them through time to adolescence. And what this shows is that it's not only the early atopy, but it's actually the exposure to the allergen at those high-risk children, which causes the allergic response by being allergic and exposed that actually increases your risk of decline in lung function later on in life. As you can see, that group that is sensitized and exposed to high allergen levels early on in life really had a risk of loss of lung function and persistent disease, while those other ones who had the viral, you know, wheeze without the allergy or exposure had less, less likelihood of it having that happen. So what can we learn from this? There is certainly a clear association between early atopy, the degree of atopy, and exposure to at-risk children and the development of asthma. In addition, there are other associations that can be associated with developing asthma and lower lung function through another mechanism, which is early asthma exacerbations. This slide is a slide of about 100 children done by Andy Bush's group, where he looked at children and he just highlights the factors that are really important in asthma exacerbations. You have children who are allergic and exposed and then hit with that virus. And look at the odds of their hospitalization rates. It's markedly higher, 10 to 20 times higher than those. And these were children who had viral PCR lavages, skin prick test testing, and home allergen levels. Just kind of highlighting that those three whammies are really important in asthma exacerbations, which you all know. The other interesting thing is that this has data has been uh, a group of children and adults by Paulo Byrne, who actually looked at the risk of exacerbations and later loss of lung function later on in life. So that if you have that ATP and exposure and viral exacerbations, that you can see in the placebo group, which they had much more significant severe exacerbations, their lung function greatly declined, as opposed to those who didn't have those significant exacerbations, as you see in the budesonite group. This data was also replicated in children in the COAST data, that if you had early significant exacerbations, you had a much higher risk of decline in lung function later on in life. So what evidence do we have that interfering with early life exposure 
an IgE-mediated allergic response to this exposure can actually prevent atopy and asthma. There actually is a study that has shown benefit. There's the Isle of Wight study that actually didn't have too many children. It had 200 babies who they did a dust mite environmental intervention where they tried to get rid of dust mite early on in life. And the interesting things from this finding is they followed them through time to see their risk of developing asthma at age eight and even at age 18. And what they identified is that if you took a group of high-risk children and you reduced their exposure to allergens early on in life, you had a decreased risk of developing allergy later on in life and actually asthma later on in life. And these effects actually persisted to age 18. Now, there's a caveat. There's many other primary prevention studies that have shown mixed effects with exposure. But I'd like to highlight that in this small study, it did show evidence that exposure and atopy early on in life, and if you prevent exposure early on in life, you could actually prevent the development of further atopy and asthma. So what are the limitations of an allergen avoidance as a prevention strategy? Well, a lot of you know that a lot of the work of some of you in this room and myself have been dealing with environmental exposure intervention studies for a while. It's impossible to really block all types of allergen antibody interactions that relate to IgE through avoidance. And there's also possibly subclinical exposures that could be increased by A to B that are not really diagnosed on routine allergy uh, tests. So it's very, very difficult in a primary prevention strategy to reduce all the possible exposures through an environmental intervention and to be able to prevent asthma. So I'm going to what is a feasible agent that you think could be used in young children that actually blocks IgA processes and maybe the logical next step in targeting atopy in the prevention of asthma. I'd like to remind you the IgE-mediated allergic process. You've got your exposure to your allergen cross-links with IgE, and for ch people who are susceptible and have IgE to that allergen, it actually triggers a response where you have mast cell-mediated release and all types of cytokines, T TNF, LR4, 5, and 13, and triggers an allergic response that we all know about that gets the itchy eyes, runny nose, and asthma. So we know that IgE is critical in this cross-linking exposure response. What can block IgE? Well, the logical choice is anti-IgE, otherwise known as Zolaire. And what evidence do we have that it could potentially prevent the development of asthma? So this was a study done in school aid children in the Inner City Asthma Consortium. And as you can see, anti-IgE actually ablates seasonal exacerbations, which are often related to viruses, compared to placebo, as you can see in the fall and winter peaks of seasonal exacerbations that were actually reduced 40 to 70 percent, particularly in those atopic exposed individuals. So blocking IgE can actually reduce these exacerbations and demonstrates the importance of IgE in these pathways. This study was replicated as the inner city asthma group then decided to do a pre-seasonal treatment with anti-IgE. And again, they found marked responses to reducing exacerbations by 50% if you just took Zolaire and treated kids pre-seasonal before that viral season, you were really able to reduce seasonal exacerbations, showing how effective even seasonal administration of IgE, anti-IgE, or Zolaire, is beneficial in school-age children. They went further to look that anti-IgE actually restores viral responses. Who would have expect that blocking IgE would actually have anything to do with viral responses, which I showed you is really important in the development of exacerbations and asthma. And actually, this study shows that actually those children who were treated with anti-IgE, again, this is school-age children, they actually had a restoration of their antiviral interferon alpha response to asthma exacerbations, highlighting that actually anti-IgE might even have antiviral properties as well. 
So what are some proposed mechanisms of how anti-IgE, or Zolaire, can act on the viral allergen-induced asthma exacerbations? You've got your cockroach in your inner city environment hooking to the mast cell, and Zolair just blocks that. There's no IgE, so even if you're sitting around with all the cockroach infestation and exposure, you can't respond to the allergen because you don't have IgE. And also, the inner city asthma work had highlighted that you can actually block, uh, anti-IG can actually restore interferon alpha responses to viruses, giving a double benefit towards something that we know is very important in persistent development of asthma through exacerbations, highlighting the importance of IgE and A to B in these processes. So I'm pleased to say this happened just a few weeks ago, that actually Ellen and I put in a study to do this very thing, to identify if blocking IgE can actually prevent the development of asthma. And I'm pleased to say that it is a seven-year trial that is going to be probably launching within the next year. It's a randomized multi-center double-blind placebo-controlled trial in those allergic kids that you see in clinic, the ones that you see that you kind of smell, they're going down the path of asthma. They're going to be allergic wheezers, and that we modeled it after the other prevention asthma study that was done by the CARE Network, which showed that giving two years of steroids, while it helped them while they were on therapy, didn't do anything in preventing the disease. So we're going to treat these young allergic wheezy toddlers for two years with anti-IgE, and then we're going to follow them two years off. And it's a seven-year trial. It's going to have two years of recruitment and five other centers. And we're really, Elliot and I are both really excited about launching this trial because this will be the first way study that's really identified early blockage because none of those other studies, actually the FDA had not even ever approved using IgE down below age four for a study. And we now have an IND down to age two to test this very hypothesis. So by blocking response to the exposure early in life, really blocking, because we're not depending on an environmental intervention, we, we could actually prevent the disease. So just in summary, A to P is important. A to P and exposure is important. A to P exposure and viruses are important. And these exacerbations are important in persistent asthma later on in life. And that blocking IgE not only blocks the response to the exposure, but actually can restore the interferon responses to viruses. And that blocking these responses early in life, we feel, really holds promise in actually preventing asthma. I'd like to acknowledge the support from Elliot, who's been for years and years as we were trying to get this concept through. Genentech and Novartis for providing drug, Tevin Merck for medications, the NIH, and all the clinical centers, including I really call my generals who've been with me for the last 10 years dealing with the Asthma Clinical Research Center at Boston, which we will help recruit the participants, and the other centers as well in Atlanta, Madison, St. Louis, and Tucson, and Hans, who helped develop some of the required mechanistic studies for the grant. Thank you. Thanks, Wanda. So for the next 10, 15 minutes, I'll try to take a different tack where Wanda was looking at primary prevention uh, uh, postnatally, um, and we took the tack of uh, trying to prevent asthma um, beginning uh, in utero. And so I will uh, present to you some of the results from our trial where we supplemented women, uh, pregnant women with vitamin D um, and follow the children up to age three. So. Uh, uh, I'll just briefly review vitamin D um, and why we, we undertook this trial, um, present to you the results of our trial, and actually there are two other trials in the literature right now, um, and go to conclusions and future directions. So this is the vitamin D metabolic pathway that we learned in medical school uh, and in college, where we make um, vitamin D uh, through exposure um, to the sun in our skin. 
um, it goes into vitamin, uh, the vitamin D goes into circulation. This is cholecalciferol. Um, this is also the same form of vitamin D that gets absorbed from the diet. Um, and if we're taking cholecalciferol uh, supplements, this goes into circulation, goes into the liver to get, to get hydroxylated. Um, and the major circulating metabolite is 25-hydroxyvitamin D. Um, we're then taught that it gets hydroxylated again in the kidneys to then form the uh, active hormone 125-dihydroxyvitamin D3. And uh, for the longest time, it was thought that uh, vitamin D was only active for the skeletal system. But we now know, um, actually, even as early as 1930, um, there were studies already ongoing to show that vitamin D had effects on essentially all cells in the body. And all cells in the body have the uh, vitamin D receptor and the mechanism to, um, to transform um, the circulating vitamin D metabolite to active hormone. Um, I will also say that cholecalciferol in and of itself, be, even before being transformed to 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol, uh, also has been shown now to have direct effects on cells um, uh, outside of the skeletal system. So vitamin D has a lot of uh, effects, um, and these are just some of the effects relevant to asthma. So it plays a role in the maturation of the immune system. Um, and again, because this is only a 15-minute talk, I won't show you the primary data. But um, if you want them, I can, I can um, uh, uh, give them to you. Uh, just contact me, and I, will I can give them to you uh, um, later. Um, it also has antiviral and antimicrobial effects um, in terms of decreasing the inflammation. Uh, when the cells are infected by viruses. Um, there have been trials of vitamin D to prevent um, uh, viral, il uh, viral respiratory illnesses, and those have not been successful. Uh, but it's now thought that vitamin D doesn't prevent uh, uh, the infections. It prevents the inflammatory response during and after the infections. Um, there is a lot of data in animal models, and we have some genomic data in humans, human uh, uh, discarded fetal lung tissue, that vitamin D actually plays a role in um, uh, lung development in utero. Um, and as you can see here with this cartoon, uh, that lung development uh, goes on until our early adulthood. Um, and we think that there may be also uh, um, effects of vitamin D um, that occur postnatally. Um, and that's gonna be an important point that I will return to later. Um, there have been studies in uh, um, human smooth muscle, airway human smooth muscle cells, uh, where vitamin D, again, has anti-inflammatory effects and effects on uh, airway remodeling. Um, and finally, um, th there are a lot of genomic effects and epigenomic effects of vitamin D. Uh, Kellen Tantasera reviewed this in 2012. Um, essentially, what we know now are there are at least 3,000 uh, regions in the genome where there are vitamin D binding uh, uh, elements. Um, and at least about 300 uh, genes that are up or down regulated um, when you give vitamin D um, in cells. Um, and most of those genes are uh, uh, in the immune um, pathways. So the reason we went for this, we did epidemiologic studies early on to look at vitamin D deficiency. Um, and we were showing some effects of vitamin D intake in pregnancy um, and wheezing in the children. Um, but the problem here is that vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency is uh, uh, very prevalent. Um, and, the pro uh, and doing more epidemiologic observational studies will not get us any further, because if you have everybody who is in the insufficient and deficient range, you don't have as big a range to see any effects of um, the high vitamin D levels. So this is just a study that was published, and in this, um, by Palacios and Gonzalez in 2014, and in this study, in this article, they actually had maps for, uh, for um, infants, for adults, and for pregnant women. And you see the same pattern where there's widespread uh, uh, deficiency. Um, additionally, vitamin D is the only nutrient where we have shown, where it's been shown, uh, that there's actually decreasing levels. So this is 
uh, uh, data from Gindi from N. Haynes, uh, where they looked at um, two time points about roughly 10 years apart. Um, and in that 10 years, um, there has been a, a halving of those patient, of those subjects who have uh, sufficient vitamin D levels thought to be 30 nanograms per ml. Um, and again, if you look at this, um, African Americans uh, um, are the ones who are at most risk for asthma and more severe asthma, and they're the ones with the lowest vitamin D levels. And so the thinking is that um, vitamin D actually works throughout life, and it starts with if you have low vitamin D um, in utero, that there's some epigenetic modification and programming that occurs, um, and that can uh, either set you on a trajectory for disease. Um, perhaps there can be some modulation of that if you get uh, higher vitamin D levels postnatally, uh, but that will need to be tested. So we set out to do the VDART trial, which is the vitamin D antenatal asthma reduction trial. Um, and this was a uh, trial where we had three clinical centers BU, WashU in St. Louis, and in Kaiser Permanente. Um, and a few weeks ago, and we unfortunately lost Bob's trunk, uh, um, and it was a big loss to uh, the asthma community, I think. Um, and uh, Len Bacarrier has taken over the PI duties at, uh, at WashU. So we, we enrolled, we screened and enrolled women who were, who were pregnant. Um, and when we were thinking about the design of this trial, what we really wanted to do was get women before they got pregnant. But that would have meant screening uh, um, thousands and thousands of women, um, and it would, have be, it would have been untenable. So what we did was we targeted uh, an N of about 870 pregnant women. The earliest we could get them was around 10 to 18 weeks uh, of, of uh, pregnancy. Um, we then uh, administered questionnaire, we drew blood, we randomized them to 4,400 IU uh, versus 400 IU per day uh, uh, of, of vitamin D, and this is vitamin D3. Uh, we then followed the pregnant women monthly. Um, we used the urine calcium to creatinine ratio to um, uh, help us monitor uh, impending hypercalcemia, and none of the women developed that. Um, we then drew blood again at 32 to 38 weeks, um, saw them during pregnancy, um, got information uh, um, uh, when they delivered, um, and draw cord, drew cord blood. We then followed the children every three months with a phone call um, and had them come in yearly for um, anthropometric uh, uh, um, measurements and examinations uh, every year. So these, this is the primary result of the trial. So we see that um, the green uh, um, uh, uh, um, graph here um, are those in the placebo arm. Um, the red are, are the ones in the intervention arm, the children in the intervention arm. Um, and the, the uh, y-axis here is the proportion free of asthma or recurrent wheeze. Uh, and we did a survival analysis. And what we saw was there was a relative reduction of about 20% in the children who uh, developed um, asthma recurrent wheeze by age three in the treatment arm compared to those in the placebo arm. The absolute rate difference was about 6.1%. It did not reach statistical significance with a strict uh, p-value of 0 0.05, uh, but it was pretty close. Um, and when you look at um, the previous years, you can see that there was actually greater reduction early on, and it looked like the, uh, uh, the effect was washing out by age three. So again, going back to the point where in, in, a, in the design of the trial, we only uh, uh, supplemented the pregnant mothers. Um, again, we had wanted to randomize the, ch the infants at birth, but again, that would have doubled, meant doubling the uh, 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 N, um, and so we didn't have supplementation postnatally. So that may be one reason why um, uh, we, we didn't get as big a difference as we had thought. Um, we then said, well, let's look at the women who uh, achieved uh, um, vitamin D levels that were in the sufficient range. 
and that is this light blue uh, curve here. Um, and you can see that they were the group that had the least uh, risk um, for developing asthma wheeze by age three in the children, compared to the, the placebo group that had low levels throughout. Uh, this group here had very small numbers, uh, and they, they were the ones with missing vitamin D levels. Um, so, we, so it looks like there is an effect in those that achieved um, the levels. We then thought, well, let's look at, at the initial levels, because we did not limit the um, uh, uh, randomization of the women or enrollment of the women to those with vitamin D deficiency. So we took all comers. Um, and when we looked at the effect in the placebo, these are now baseline levels of uh, vitamin D3, um, and this is uh, um, measured in nanograms per ml of 25 hydroxy. We don't see anything in the placebo group. But surprisingly, a little bit surprisingly, we see a very strong linear effect um, in those who were on, on the treatment. Um, this odds ratio here is 0.2, so there's about an 80 80 to 85 percent reduction in the risk for asthma wheeze by age three if you started off with a high level and you were on the treatment arm. So then we looked at, we said, well, it looks like achieved level is important. It also looks like initial level is important. And so what the, the concept of having high levels throughout pregnancy seemed to be coming out here. And when we looked at those women who had initial high levels and, and, and uh, achieved high levels, they were again the group that had, their children had the group that had the lowest uh, risk for developing asthma wheeze by age three. So there are actually uh, uh, additional trials in the literature. In the same issue of JAMA where our trial was published, uh, there was this uh, uh, trial from COPSAC. Um, they enrolled 623 women at 24 weeks gestation, so later than ours. Uh, they had a lower dose, which was 2,400 IU uh, plus 400, so essentially 2,800 um, versus placebo plus 400 IU per day. Um, the, these were their main results. What they saw, their hazard ratio was 0.76, so about a 26% reduction, very similar to what we found, um, but not significant. They also did, however, a, a, an, an analysis looking at achieved levels. And again, um, those uh, who, who had the lowest achieved levels had the highest risk in their children for developing recur recurrent wheeze by age three. So again, the concept of the level, uh, um, achieved level is coming out, I think. There's another smaller trial, the Gold Ring, Gold Ring trial, but they only enrolled about 180 women they enrolled them into three arms, a placebo group where no, they did not give vitamin D, um, a group they gave 800 IU per day, and a group they gave one single bolus of 200,000 IU. Um, and, and when you look at, when we did a meta-analysis of these three trials, looking at recurrent wheeze as the outcome, we see a, a significant effect, whether it's including the three or just the, uh, uh, the two um, ones where we were earlier where we supplemented earlier. Um, and so what, what, do we, what do I take away from all these? So I think the, the results from these three trials are very suggestive that prenatal vitamin D supplementation has an effect on early wheezing phenotypes. Is this asthma? I think it's too early to tell, but I think even though uh, um, we're not uh, um, intervening on asthma per se, uh, there's a potential to have significant cost savings relative to an inexpensive intervention because, and the pediatricians can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the kids who are wheezing, even if they don't get a label of asthma, are essentially treated the same way. They're given inhaled corticosteroids, they have high use of, um, of uh, health uh, um, uh, uh, healthcare. Um, we need to have long-term follow-up of these children, and in VDART, we're following the children now up to age six, so we should have the data within another year and a half. Um, the me mechanisms remain unclear. So is this intervening in viral-induced wheezing? Is it with a lung, lung function? Or is it something with having, having to do with immune effects? Um, and future studies need to account for the issues that we learned 
uh, from doing these initial trials. So I think the timing is gonna be very important. I think the earlier you can intervene, the better uh, for vitamin D. It's important to maintain the levels throughout pregnancy. And again, um, the question of whether supplementing post-delivery, uh, I think is gonna be important, uh, but that's gonna need to be studied also. And again, measurement of lung functions and immune uh, function studies in these uh, trials need to be done. Um, and these are just all the folks. We are now collaborating with the COPSAC trial uh, folks, and Helene Wolsk is ask, actually uh, in our lab now and doing some of, the, some of these uh, data that I presented uh, were done by her. And I think that's it. Uh, so hi, I'm Joanne Sordillo. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm the last topic and um, probably the least certain one, uh, but an interesting one. And this is about the uh, early life microbiome as a potential target uh, for the primary prevention of asthma. Uh, so first, I'll just discuss the microbiome in general and all of the different types of functions it does for us, just as a bit of background. Uh, so many of you may know that the microbiome is important for biosynthesis of vitamins and amino acids, metabolism of therapeutics. Can you guys see my pointer? Yeah, there you go. Um, and there's another um, interesting function uh, the, that's gotten a lot of attention recently, which is that the microbiome can produce neuroactive metabolites and potentially alter uh, neurologic development and have um, implications for neurological outcomes. But as asthma epidemiologists and clinicians, uh, we're really interested in the effect of the microbiome on the development and training of the immune system. Uh, now, I have a bunch of uh, factoids listed up here about the microbiome, and these numbers are always changing. Uh, but it's estimated that there are about 400 to 1,000 individual species of bacteria uh, in the gut. Um, 3.3 million microbial genes, so they re the microbial uh, genome kind of really outnumbers our own. Uh, the microbiome functions as an immunologically and metabolically distinct organ, and we've had a symbiotic relationship with the uh, microbiome, with our own microbiome, for millions and millions of years, uh, for million years. Uh, so um, in, in continuing the background a little bit, the microbiome can be considered another dimension of omics, right? So we have genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics. Recently, metabolomics has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, and now we're discussing microbiomics today. And of course, you can think of all different types of ways that these other omics might interact with the microbiome. For instance, host genes can influence the selection of microbes. Uh, the microbes themselves produce bacterial metabolites that contribute to the metabolome. And all of these omics have uh, implications for our immune system development. And I should mention also that the gut microbiome is the largest source of immune stimulation, uh, so another important factor to consider as well. Uh, now, I have this slide up here uh, showing a nice diagram from a Nature Review published in 2013. Uh, and I'm not an immunologist, I'm an epidemiologist, uh, but I'll just highlight some of the important points here about immune system development. Uh, so the gut microbiome has an important role in innate and adaptive immune system maturation, uh, including um, with respect to tolerogenic uh, dendritic cell activation, which is shown a bit here. The dendritic cells are kind of sampling some of the microbes uh, uh, in the gut. Th1 cell differentiation, uh, T regulatory cell uh, generation and expansion. Uh, and a lot of important work has been done by Dennis Casper's group focusing on uh, Bacteroides antigen, the PSA from Bacteroides fragilis, which can enhance Treg function, correct Th1, Th2 imbalance, and protect against autoimmune and inflammatory disease in animal models. Uh, so this was important work. And I should mention that these immune uh, effects aren't all local to the gut. Of course, there are systemic implications, okay? So the gut microbiome matters for these T cell populations uh, in a systemic way. So I won't go into all the VDART population stuff because Gus already did that very nicely, so I won't describe it. But I will say that we have an ancillary study looking at the microbiome in this clinical trial population. Uh, so for the moms, we have 150 stool samples. And for the kids here, we have 
in infancy at age three to six months, 333 samples, and we have longitudinal sampling at these different time points. Uh, so I'll, t I'll share some of the data with you today that's focused more on this infant time point, but I just wanted to point out that we have uh, 2,000 data points, really, uh, to look at longitudinal microbiome trajectories and asthma, and I'm tremendously excited about that. Um, but anyway, I'll present more of this, this time point here today. Uh, but of course, we're interested in what predicts or what characteristics are associated with the infant gut microbiome uh, at this uh, time point here. And these are things like circumstances of labor and delivery, demographic variables like gender, race, age at fecal flora sampling, vitamin D, uh, of course, uh, breastfeeding, and environmental factors as well, possibly. Uh, and then, of course, we're interested in how the microbiome relates to the phenotypes that we'd like to examine, like wheeze and LRI and asthma, et cetera. Okay, so a first data slide about the VDART uh, cohort here is, is, the message is kind of at the top. Uh, factors that are associated or with asthma development, things like mode of delivery, race, and breastfeeding, are also linked to alterations in the gut microbiota. And uh, so here I have, um, an analysis that I've done looking at bacterial coabundance groupings in the infant gut microbiome. So what I did was a factor analysis on the top 25 taxa detected in the infant gut, and four coabundance groupings emerged from this. Okay, one was a, uh, a Firmicutes factor that had positive loadings for Lactobacillus and Clostridialis, a Proteobacteria factor that had positive loadings for Klebsiella and Enterobacter, a Bacteroidetes uh, factor that was positive positively loaded for Bacteroidetes, but had negative factor loadings for Shigella and Bifidobacterium. And another Firmicutes factor also uh, came out of this as well. And so scores for these factors, for these coabundance groupings, were used as outcomes in this uh, linear regression model. And so here are all the predictors that we examined, but the main message is over here. The, the mode of delivery, breath, breastfeeding, and race really seem to matter a lot. Uh, so for C-section-born infants, those infants had higher Lactobacillus clostridiale scores, they had higher proteobacteria factor scores, and lower Bacteroides, and this has been shown in some other studies, uh, especially the relationship with Bacteroides. Breastfeeding uh, was associated with lower Lactobacillus and clostridiale uh, scores also has been shown in some other studies. But the race finding is uh, quite novel. Uh, we find that the African-American infants have higher proteobacteria scores and lower Bacteroides scores, and the Caucasian infants here have the reverse profile. So um, they have lower proteobacteria and higher Bacteroides, uh, which is interesting. And then we also saw some effect of cord blood vitamin D um, on increased Lactobacillus scores. Okay, so what about the next relationship, right? The infant gut microbiome and allergic disease, which is what we're really interested in. Uh, so we're just, um, there have been some studies, but we're really just at the beginning of looking at this and thinking about it. Uh, so there's an Abramson et al. publication showing that reduced diversity is associated with increased asthma risk. Uh, lower abundance of bifidobacterium has been seen in atopic versus non-atopic children. There are some animal model data showing that lactobacillus suppresses IgE production. And then there was um, a very nice publication in Science Translational Medicine in 2015 identifying these um, microbes that they identified with the acronym FLAVOR. Uh, so Fecalibacterium, Lachnospira, Villanella, and Rothia. These were associated with decreased, oh, these were decreased in children at risk of asthma. And so here's a figure from that uh, publication, this Arietta et al. publication. Uh, and you can see this is the microbiome at, at three months. These are the tax of the flavor microbes, as they call them, um, at three months and at one year. And th this is actually relative quantification uh, by qPCR, I believe. And you can see that in the, in the infants that had HP and wheeze, these flavor microbes uh, had lower, um, were lower in quantity at three months, but they did not see that relationship at one year. So this is HP and, and wheeze at age three. Um, and so the, relation, the relationship between the microbes and atopic wheeze at age three um, wasn't quite as, as apparent in the year one data. And this kind of tells us that window and timing uh, really might matter a lot, which is one point I forgot to make on my VDART slide when I showed you all those, those samples between infancy and age three we were collecting in that really dynamic window. Okay. All right, so more VDART findings here. Uh, so the micro, these are the microbiome features that discriminate infants 
with repeated wheeze. Uh, so this is the infant gut microbiome, of course, and repeated wheeze uh, in the first year of life. Uh, this was an LDA analysis using LEFSA. And you can see that uh, Clostridialis here really seem to discriminate those infants that have repeated wheeze, whereas Bacteroidetes discriminate those who do not. And when you put this in an adjusted logistic regression model, uh, you can see that uh, one of the top Clostridialis here, Blautia, shows a small uh, increased odds of repeated wheeze. This is for an interquartile range increase. And then detectable Megasphera, another Clostridialis member, uh, is associated with uh, increased uh, wheeze as well, with an odds ratio of 1.8. Then we also looked at LRI, lower respiratory tract infection, and found that the infants that had um, greater relative abundance of proteobacteria like Escherichia and Chronobacter were more likely to be classified in the LRI yes category, whereas infants that had Poptonyphilus and Cluivera were more likely to not have experienced an LRI. So these were discriminating features of the microbiome for LRI. Uh, I also looked at uh, this in an adjusted logistic regression model to give you an idea about the odds ratios. Uh, so for uh, Chronobacter, there was an odds ratio of 1.5, um, 1.4 for Escherichia. Uh, and then here are the, the protective effects, potentially, uh, of these, um, these two microbes within the Clostridialis and Enterobacteriaceae group as well. Okay, so we've discussed a little background about the microbiome, some associations with predictors and with asthma and, and allergy, but what about manipulating the microbiome? Because that might be the goal, right? Uh, well, I think there's a lot of optimism about that, about altering the microbiome to prevent disease, including asthma and allergies, which I think is great. But there's still a lot that we have to learn before we delve in and start changing the microbiome, I think. Uh, for instance, we need to learn more about the specific communities and their functions and metabolites that confer protection or alternatively have adverse effects. We would like to know more about microbial interactions with host and environmental factors. And then we'd want to understand more about the impact of stage of life and timing. You know, when are we going to intervene? Uh, we think that this infancy through age three time point is, uh, or, or window uh, is most likely key, but it would be better to investigate that more first. That being said, two different types of interventions aimed at manipulating microbiota have been attempted, and these are probiotic trials and a technique called vaginal seeding um, or vaginal swabbing of C-section-born infants. All right, so there was a nice review um, or meta-analysis in 2013 that looked at probiotics as preventative therapies for wheeze and asthma. Uh, and this is prenatal and postnatal supplementation. These are the studies, and these are forest plots, which I'm sure you've seen uh, before. Prenatal and postnatal up here, postnatal down here. Uh, and here's sort of an overall uh, estimate accounting for all of these studies um, of risk for the prenatal and postnatal and the postnatal alone. And you can see that there's not really much going on here. There's no clear evidence of a protective effect uh, for wheeze and asthma. Now, I should mention that these trials weren't all the same. Um, some you know, were bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, some were probi probiotic mixtures. Um, the, but even when you kind of parse out you know, similar trials, the effects don't always uh, agree. All right, so here is probiotics administration and, and total serum IgE, a meta-analysis pr um, produced by the same authors here. Uh, and this, for this, we do actually see a potentially an effect. Probiotics are associated with a decreased mean in total IgE which is shown down here in the forest plot. And you really see the effect when you stratify by atopic disease for, for children with atopic disease. Um, you know, we, we do see a, a more marked decrease here for probiotic administration. Okay, and here's the bit about vaginal seeding, which is sort of a, uh, a clever idea. Uh, so vaginal seeding as an intervention to alter the microbial flora of the infants now, whether or not vaginal seeding ultimately protects against asthma and allergies, it's too early to say, and no one's really even attempted that yet. We're still just doing this piece to see if it alters the flora in the first place, uh, or, or this, these investigators have tried it. Uh, so vaginal seeding is using a gauze swab to transfer maternal vaginal fluid containing the vaginal microbiota, of course, onto the infant born by cesarean section. And so D Dominguez Bello et al. Uh, published this uh, recently in 2016 as a pilot of 18 infants. So the C-section delivered, delivered infants 
um, a portion of them, were exposed to maternal vaginal fluids at birth, and it was noticed that um, there was enrichment for the vaginal microbiota in the oral, gut, and skin microbiomes of the vaginally swabbed or vaginally seeded infants that had been seed section delivered, and also in the vaginally delivered infants, but that vaginal microbes were underrepresented in C-section born infants who were not exposed to the vaginal swabs. So here's one of the figures from that Dominguez Bello paper. And you can see the vaginal um, bars are the blue ones here. Uh, the inoculated or the swabbed infants are in green. And then just the C-section born infants often barely make a, make a mark here on the graphs, uh, are in red. Uh, and, and so here's bacteroides, relative abundance. And these are different sites, so anal, skin, are shown here. Uh, so here's bacteroides, uh, which is highest in the vaginally delivered infants, but shows some presence in the inoculated infants. And you might be thinking, well, bacteroides, that's really not a, th what we think of when we think of vaginal flora. But what could be happening here is that the inoculum from the vaginal flora is somehow changing the microbiome overall, right, in a way that might support more bacteroides growth. Uh, okay, and so lactobacillus is an obvious one, though, uh, from the vaginal microbiome. Uh, and so you can see the, the comparable levels here, uh, the anal site for, the, um, for lactobacillus abundance. Okay, so conclusions and future directions here. Uh, the initial interventions like probiotic clinical trials thus far ha um, have yet to demonstrate a consistent protective effect for asthma and allergy, um, and even studies published beyond that meta-analysis that I showed you support, support that statement. Uh, vaginal seeding may alter the microbiome of infants, and this has future potential implications for reducing asthma and allergy risk. But further studies are required to understand how the microbiome impacts asthma and allergic disease incidents before we can really make strong recommendations about what to do in terms of specific microbes or microbial products to administer as preventative therapies. Uh, and, and also uncovering key predictors or modifiers of the microbiome may help tailor future interventions uh, we may be able to shape the microbiome by intervening, not with microbes specifically or microbial products, but by altering the factors we know are, are associated with either a, a more beneficial, with, with a more beneficial microbiome. Okay, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm much more optimistic than I was at the start of the talk. <laughs> Can I invite the panelists to come up and uh, we'll take questions as a group, if, if we could, and we open it up for your questions. And uh, I always get to then to start while you think of a question. I wanted to follow up on the issue of timing and when an intervention uh, is important or perhaps even the duration of the in intervention. That is, let's start with you, Wanda, if you stopped an anti i uh, IgE intervention, at what age do you think you could stop without then the risk resurfacing? That is, those who are predisposed to develop asthma, how long does that risk persist? Uh, and how long would you have to uh, introduce an intervention in childhood? So from all the studies that I had quoted and some others, it's really that early window of preschool age um, where if kids are developing more allergy in that early stage. It's much more of a risk than if you're developing at age seven or eight or nine. So that's why we think that that treatment at age two to three is that critical window and that will follow them afterwards. Now sure, you could always think about doing some pregnancy studies and things. Clearly IgE blockade is not feasible in those. But as we've seen, some of those challenges are too of what's what's passed on to the infant. You know, p people are always thinking earlier is better, but from some of the data I've seen, I think that there's an early critical window that's not too late. And you, if you saw the atopic march, it actually goes on into school age. So even if you probably intervened even a little bit later, it still might not be too late to modify the disease. You might not do primary prevention but you got to at least test the concept that you can modify the disease before you go. I early. just wanted to follow up. My question was really, how soon can you stop? So not how, how oh, early okay. do you have to begin the intervention, but at what point, if you stopped, would there be a risk that now? You know, at what point does low vitamin D put you back at risk, having supplemented it for the first years of infancy or that sort of thing? I mean, 
You, I mean, th I mean, those are good questions, but um, from what I've seen, it's that those couple of years early, and you've got to stop sometime if you're going to do a prevention study, right? In, in the feasible time that we're able to identify, um, I don't see it feasible to treat somebody forever with some of these things. Vitamin D, you might be able to, but so far we haven't seen. So I, I think in an immune modulatory thing, a couple of years should at least give us a signal. Yeah, so I think the, the answer to the question is really, it'll depend on what, what uh, agent you're looking yeah, at. Sure. So, so vitamin D is not a biologic. It's, it's right. relatively cheap. And, and if you ask Scott, everybody should be on vitamin yeah, D forever. throughout life, right? Um, sure. And, and, I, and I, I kind of believe that too. So looking at, you know, uh, at human evolution, we evolved um, to become more efficient at, um, at uh, uh, manufacturing vitamin D. The early humans who then moved out of the equator had to adapt. And the adaptation were diets very high in vitamin D. Um, and so with modern life, we've um, uh, gone away from that. We've put on clothes. We're in a sun, uh, less sun, a low sun environment. And so we all have vitamin D uh, uh, insufficiency. And so with, but it's, it's not a magic bullet. And I think the way vitamin D is working is it's a modulator of other uh, exposures. So because you're going to be exposed to allergens throughout life, to oxidants throughout life, um, I think maintaining a vitamin D level that's in the sufficient range is going to be important. There's a study coming out. In, in, in Jackie from Pat Holt's group, um, where they followed children through um, teenage years. And the children who had, who had maintained their vitamin D levels above 30 up to age 10, so from birth through age 10, uh, were the ones who um, had the lowest risk for asthma and wheeze by their early teen years. So I think there, I mean, with vitamin D, I think you need to keep it up uh, um, throughout, so. early onset asthma, childhood asthma. Mm -hmm. What about all these factors as they affect late onset asthma, adult onset asthma? What, what are the data there? So um, from an epidemiologic standpoint, we think that at least the data that we, we, we know about are that most of these quote unquote adult onset asthmatics probably had some uh, symptoms when they were young that uh, either they don't remember or you know, they've grown, they've quote unquote, grown out of their asthma. Um, but I think there are some real uh, um, uh, folks who do develop asthma and allergies when, when they're much older. Um, so I think they're much, a much smaller group. So I haven't seen any primary prevention trials for older uh, uh, populations. Um, I, I don't know if Wanda has seen anything. Yeah, I mean, you saw, you saw the data from our clinic. You know, you start with allergy and it escalates through, but that's until early age. It's very rare to develop. There's, there's some, but we're trying to, you know, test the concept of modifying or preventing. I think, in general, the childhood period is when you're going to try to intervene for a prevention strategy. Once they're older, you could maybe reduce the fact you know, reduce the morbidity of people who develop it later on. But that's a much rarer group. Yeah, so, so I'm actually an adult pulmonologist, but I study kids because I think yeah, that's yeah. where we can intervene. Right, right. Yeah. And, uh, I'll just ask you, sure. we're talking about the microbiome. Is there a respiratory microbiome in healthy people, and is that important at all? Um, so, so yes, there is a, a respiratory microbiome. and. Um, I was recently at ATS at a poster discussion session, and I was the only gut person in the room. They were all airway people. Um, <laughs> so yes, yes, for sure. Um, there is a respiratory microbiome. Um, the gut's being studied more, I think, um, for early life before, um, I think more studies have been done in the airways looking at severe asthmatics or um, asthma exacerbations. Although there, uh, there are a couple of studies looking at airway microbiome in asthma development. One found um, that streptococcus in the nasopharynx in early life is associated with increased asthma risk. 
And I believe another might have found that more Excel in matters as, as well. Um, yeah. And actually, I didn't mention, I mean, I just talked about the anti-IG study because that's the one I'm leading, but we are starting also a primary prevention looking at killed bacterial lysate. Fernando Martinez is the PI in Tucson. But so that is in infants that are healthy, giving them, and we probably will be altering the microbiome, but that's a gut mechanism and we'll probably be collecting stool as well. So that's another strategy that people are trying. As, you, as Joanne showed, the probiotics has really been a mixed bag. Um, and maybe part of it is we don't fully understand the microbiome as well enough. It's hard to intervene. We understand that you, you have an allergen and you block it with, I, you know, and you have IgE, you cause the thing. So at least we have a better understanding of that mechanism. Yeah, I think um, it, it, my, my, uh, my bias is that I think because of the amount of um, bacteria that you're exposed to in the gut, that, that probably starts off in the gut, and you have priming or, or you know, priming of your or, uh, immune cells there, and then there's homing to the lung. Um, so I think that is, I think in diseased subjects, asthmatic, COPD, CF, they definitely have altered microbiomes. But whether their altered microbiomes begin before disease starts, I think is still a question. Um, the Chow, Chow's uh, study from COPSAC, they did a sub-study um, looking at um, nasal swabs. And, and or I think it was gene expression. Uh, and in those who were given vitamin D, their um, microbiome, um, their microbiomes were sort of geared towards um, uh, again, protective uh, um, microbiomes in the airway. So maybe there is uh, uh, an effect there, but it's a relatively understudied area at this point. Well, yeah. Yes, Nora. One last question then. Okay. Um, in the, so congratulations on the grant. <sighs> Are you guys going to be able to do some other, so such a neat study to immunomodulate infants and uncommon, obviously. I'm just wondering how many other things you guys are going to be able to address with those. Like, will you be able to see food allergy sensitization? Oh, I mean, I'm an allergist. So we're following the whole allergic atopic march. I mean, that's why NIAID is actually very prepared to follow this cohort for a long time, because no one has intervened on IgE at this age. So absolutely. The, the grant is prevents an asthma prevention study, but we're going to, to follow. The other thing about the timing, you know, the, the recent stuff with Gideon Lack, where he had his primary prevention strategy for food allergy, a year, they just did it for that year, and those effects, there's been back-to-back -back papers annually coming from their group showing that they, the intervention sustained benefit. They, he didn't keep feeding peanut for years and years after. So that gives us promise, too. We gotta just see the signal. Um, because there's, there's also compliance in any interventions. I mean, of course, for biologic, there's compliance. Even something like vitamin D, even something like taking probiotics, even something like taking peanut every day is a challenge when it comes to human beings. So, but yes, we'll, we'll look at all that stuff. And a lot of immune studies will, can be done from the study. Well, thank you all. Thank you for participation. Thanks for a terrific, stimulating afternoon.